our five speakers and uh, we have a very very uh, powerful uh, panel of speakers uh, representing various private public and you know um, some uh, 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 you know non governmental and government related <clears throat> um, some thought leaders and very very influencers and critical players are going to share uh, some of the opportunities and how it's impacted uh, because of uh, covid situation uh, what are the you know changes so they will be sharing um, uh, uh, their expertise and uh, some of the uh, current uh, uh, hot topics, uh, um, and that's primarily, I think, COVID-related challenges overcoming. And um, the sequence uh, is, um, I think, it just just a, a couple of quick thoughts. Um, the the seminar is the webinar is focused on the Asia Southeast Asia. Uh, and Southeast Asia is actually, uh, with respect to food, it uh, is a, a, at a very high um, uh, uh, degree of self-sufficiency, uh, about 128.9%, according to some statistics. And uh, uh, there's a sufficient uh, uh, excess supply of uh, food uh, that is available for uh, export. So, for example, Thailand and Vietnam are the second and third biggest rice exporters in the world. And 90% uh, of global uh, you know, output of palm oil um, uh, production is contributed by Indonesia and Malaysia. And then according to World Bank data, 35% of the gross domestic product in the Asian countries is contributed by agribusinesses and roughly 70%. Uh, the Asian countries also account for 17% of the total aquaculture production of the world. And growth in niche export uh, and GI tag products such as GI protected fish sauce from Vietnam uh, are uh, growing at a, a very healthy rates. So given that, I mean, Asia region uh, is very, the agriculture uh, is very, very important. And um, so the number of speakers we have, I will uh, just um, do a quick introduction and I will then I will ask uh, the speakers to uh, give their own introduction uh, initially. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, go for presentations. So we have uh, uh, Graham Dixie, uh, Executive Director of Grow Asia. We have Jerry Jing uh, Pakturan, Country Program Manager from IFAD, and Dina Umali Deninger, uh, Agriculture Practice Manager, East Asia and Pacific Region from World Bank, and Isabel Disitri, Founder and CEO of ID Capital, and uh, Prasoon Das, uh, Secretary General of APRACA. So this is the sequence. Uh, the way uh, uh, we are going to start is um, with uh, each speaker would have a, a seven to eight minutes to present and then followed up by uh, five to six minutes of Q&A. So feel free to the audience, uh, uh, type your questions uh, for that particular speaker as they're speaking. And then we'll pick up a couple of questions from that and uh, uh, the speakers would be happy to answer. And then um, after uh, everything is over, if you have a few more uh, minutes, we could always uh, uh, do a more Q&A session, but uh, that's how it's going to work. We have about uh, uh, 90 minutes. So each uh, speaker, uh, we will be doing about 15 minutes. Uh, uh, we have about five speakers. So without further ado, uh, can I ask uh, Graham, uh, Jerry, Isabel, Dina, Prasoon in that order, uh, if you could start uh, just a quick introduction of yourself and um, yourself, your organization. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk detail, more details uh, as we, uh, when your turn comes, but I would, I think it's, it would be helpful for the uh, audience. So, sure. well, yeah. sure. Welcome everybody. Um, thank you. I can see that there's n over nearly a hundred people attending. So welcome to you all. My name is Graham Dixie. I'm the executive director of Grow Asia. And Grow Asia is quite a special organization. It works on this, that if you can get conversations between the public sector, the private sector, and the producers, the balance of probabilities is they can make better decisions collectively. And so that we have set up across the region, um, six of these country partnerships um, with offices in Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. And in total, there's probably about 500 partners, half of which are the private sector, and half of that is the multinationals. The other half is the local businesses. 
and the other 50% is made up broadly evenly between farmer organizations, uh, civil society, and government agencies. And they come together in working groups and look at the problems, particularly of smallholders, and how those can be resolved through collective action and in what's called the pre-competitive space. In other words, they are doing things that they couldn't do on their own. So this can be value chain projects. This can be about particular things like agricultural finance. And then in the regional space, we operate particularly with the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, so guidelines for responsible investing, um, a, a coordinated action over the control of fall armyworm, and just most recently, and what I will allude to here, is the work that we've done bringing together those partners to think about the solutions to the problems that COVID has revealed. Over. Yeah, thank you, Graham. That was a good introduction. Yeah, Jerry, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, from my side here in uh, the Philippines, Southern Philippines. So I'm uh, Jing Pakturan. I represent uh, IFAD, International Fund for Agricultural Development. Uh, IFAD is an international financial institution, and uh, we are also a specialized agency of the United Nations. And uh, IFAD's business model is mainly from its founding is to finance governments, with projects that are in the agriculture and rural space. Uh, we have about uh, over 100 member countries that uh, IFAD uh, provides uh, various financing projects. And very recently, uh, this year, IFAD has opened a new window. It's a private sector window that now aims to directly finance small and medium enterprises. And that window is now being uh, developed and hopefully within the year or next uh, that I'll be able to start and finance uh, directly small and medium enterprises. For this webinar, uh, I'll, I'll be able to speak uh, uh, very specific examples on two countries, the Philippines and Myanmar, which I am in charge uh, of uh, for these three months uh, in, in, in this context. So I'll end there and later I'll, I'll give more information about the work we do in these two countries. And thank you for inviting us uh, to this webinar. <clears throat> yeah, Dina, please. Uh, thank you. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening <laughs> to all the participants. Um, I'm happy to join this webinar. I am Dina Umali Dyinger. I'm the practice manager for agriculture covering um, East Asia and the Pacific region of the World Bank. So the World Bank is also another international financial uh, institution, and we provide technical assistance, loans, and grants to the government of the 189 member countries of, of the World Bank. Our, our mission is to promote shared prosperity and to eliminate extreme poverty. Um, so what does this mean when we talk about um, agriculture? So we are really supporting the agriculture and rural development programs of the government uh, that we work with by providing technical assistance and loans and grants uh, to the government. Uh, we focus on increasing productivity, uh, increasing farmer productivity by promoting adoption of climate smart and nutrition sensitive agriculture technologies and practices. We help with linking farmers, smallholder farmers to, to market, uh, supporting agriculture value chain development, and really hope uh, promoting the creation of better livelihoods and jobs in rural areas. So in addition to the uh, technical assistance, uh, currently we have an agriculture project portfolio totaling $3.2 billion in the East Asia and Pacific region. So I'll, I can give more specifics of what we do in the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dina. Isabel, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be with you today. So my name is Isabel de Cidre. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called ID Capital, headquartered in Singapore. And we are active in the domain of tech apply to food and agriculture. So we come from the perspective that technology in some instances can really help the food supply chain progress towards more sustainability. And we are here to encourage players in that space. So how do we do so? We do it in three manners. First, we are providing private capital, venture capital funding to some startups. 
Second, we are advising and consulting for big corporations, for family offices, on and off for some governments, on the ground that they are really diamond in the rough, so to say, and uh, capital can really help them reach their full potential. And what we are best known for is the Future Food Asia platform that comes to life in multiple manners, but in particular, one a, once a year, we run the Future Food Asia Awards, where we celebrate the talents of the region. Also knowing that regions and countries have different kind of problems, but one of the markers of Asia and Southeast Asia in particular is smallholder farmers. So um, this year, the Future Food Asia Awards is going again to culminate in a conference. This one, it will be semi-virtual in September. And uh, recently we have announced that Corteva, one of our partners is joining us for um, a new prize that will be given to companies progressing food resilience. So it's a prize for startups helping food resilience. And I will delve into how technology can play a role, what it can do, and also what it cannot do. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, Prasun, please go ahead. And good afternoon, good morning, and uh, uh, to all who joined this webinar. Um, Prasun, serving as a Secretary General currently uh, at the Asia Pacific Rural Agricultural Credit Association, uh, which was established in 1977 uh, uh, by uh, the auspices of uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. The Secretariat is based in Bangkok, but we have offices in uh, Philippines, uh, Jakarta, uh, Beijing, and Mumbai. Uh, they are uh, operating in a different aspects, like some of them are in training, some of them are in research in banking, rural banking, some of them are offering consultancy services, and also one office for the for our uh, uh, publication. Uh, we are currently working in 24 countries, so they are the member countries of APRACA, with 89 financial institutions, which include central banks, development financial institutions, commercial banks, and uh, Apex financial cooperatives with uh, the national level associations of the bankers and the cooperatives, for example, IBA in India, like uh, 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 Pakistan Microfinance Association. So we also work with associations. We work closely with our members to provide basically three things. One is the technical backstopping, uh, which uh, they need much uh, because they want to know more about the other, uh, what the others are working. And then we also uh, uh, build the capacity of our members, then engage with the policy uh, level institutions and provide then the international platform for mutual exchanges and the pra best practices in agriculture and rural finances. So that's all from my side. Yeah, thank you, Prasyan. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the, thanks for that uh, good introduction. So that uh, will give a very good uh, idea about uh, the background of the speakers, um, give more details. Um, so we have actually uh, registrations from 40 different countries um, so I think uh, we have an audience from all over the world, but uh, I think uh, the focus is definitely on the uh, ASEAN and uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so Graham, um, you could uh, basically start your presentation. Uh, you have a, let's say seven to eight minutes. Let's try to uh, complete in that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Graham. Thanks, Benkat. Um, I've been tasked with trying to paint a bit of an overall picture. Um, of what's happening in the agricultural space as a consequence of COVID. Um, and what I will do is that I will outline some of the symptoms, but more focus on what are the causes of the problems. And then particularly the piece that you'll be most interested in is some of the solutions that seem to be emerging out of that. There are sort of four foundations for my thinking around this. The first one has been that the Council of Ministers in the ASEAN um, made a statement and it was a powerful statement saying we have got to keep our flows of product and particularly agricultural products flowing but they also asked for something else they said we are looking for solutions to improve our market systems and our food systems so that they're more sustainable more resilient and and um, uh, uh, more more inclusive but they were particularly suggested that the solutions they were looking for were multi-sectorial in other words, they wanted the private sector, the public sector to come together and go beyond agribusiness. 
And what um, COVID has shown, it's spotlighted some of the weaknesses that we have in our supply chains, in our food systems. And the conversations we've had with private sectors, but actually before the COVID crisis, highlighted their concerns, which were issues around long-term environment degradation and climate change. They were really worried about food and its implications on food losses, food safety, health and nutrition. They made a fascinating comment about their long-term concerns about agriculture and will the aging farming population and the fact that labor is leaving agriculture, who's gonna be doing the farming in the future? And then they made this insightful comment, which was that they were anticipating, and this was before COVID, an increasing number of extreme events and they didn't feel that we were prepared for that. So what has happened in COVID? Well, the first thing to say is that the re actually the impact of COVID on our food systems has been, there's one word for it, it's patchy. You've said, you have Philippines saying, actually it didn't affect our export trade in bananas, pineapples and coconut, but internally we had some problems with food getting through because the green lanes weren't working. You have Vietnam, which had a real close off in its export markets to Vietnam, uh, to China, and particularly on fish, fish exports dropping by 30%. Um, but now that is all booming back again, their exports are happening. Similarly with Cambodia, we've seen an increase in exports, and we've had Myanmar, particularly on its, own, its external trade, having problems with borders and transport into China being difficult, access to the Indian market being difficult. So we have this patchy situation. And when we get down to what's actually happening, the first thing that's happening is the consumer has been changing across the region. He or she has been, um, has clearly moved away from um, food service restaurants. So that market is sort of closed off, but what they've been keen to purchase is fresh product, fruit, vegetables, they're looking for product to cook at home. They are um, shopping more in supermarkets. They're interested in local supply chains, and if they can buy things on the internet, they are. Which has meant that if you're a farmer supplying to the food and federal sector, you have a problem. The second thing that's happened is um, that product, um, that cash is not necessarily be moving. Those farmers who's had lost their markets, whether they're exports to China, or whether their green lane, food lane's not working, uh, have this serious concern that they haven't been paid for the last crop. Will they be able to afford to plant the next crop? Is there in the pipeline a real problem on food security? Some of the farmers have talked about difficulty getting labor to their fields. Uh, and um, all of this comes down to one thing that has been happening is the difficulty of moving product from the rural space to the urban space. And often local jurisdictions have been holding up consignments, not realizing that they were allowed through the processes and procedures. So what are the solutions? Well, on the logistics side, let's start with there because that's top of the priorities of people talking is let, can we make rural logistics work better? And certainly the green lanes have worked quite effectively, but they can certainly be improved and they've often had short-term holdups. But in the long term, maybe we should be thinking much, much more creatively. When we think of the incredible innovation in urban logistics and things like Uber and um, Grab, why can't that kind of level of digital innovation be applied into the rural space? I mean, picture this, if, that if villagers actually had an application, an open source application to enable them to be able to consolidate loads from six or seven different farmers, be able to attract in a trucker who's passing has got an empty back hall, or be able to put that consignment out to bid by the local privateers. Can we make first let first mile connectivity work? The second thing is cash, and we've seen cash being locked up. And you were and Dina and others will talk about the e-voucher scheme that they're thinking about to solve some of these problems about new people not being able to afford their next crop. But actually mobile money is a very interesting technique and technology for enabling the unbanked to become able to participate in modern financial systems. And it does something extraordinary. It, open, it not only enables the purchasing of their product easier by agribusiness, it enables them to buy inputs, but it also enables the third thing that I wanted to touch on, which is to, it enables digital marketing platforms. 
What we've seen is that this crisis has meant that the consumer has been really keen to buy product, if they can, on the internet. And, and you know, an example here is Pino Dio Dio, a Chinese company, which has business has boomed to the level that they sell $20 billion worth of product directly from farmers selling either to agribusinesses or to the consumer sector. And this is beginning to hum in, happen in the ASEAN. Tani Hub in Indonesia's market has really grown up. Um, Philippines is exploring this. Um, and um, Cambodia is looking to create that platform to enable agribusinesses so when they buy their corn, when they buy their cassava, their cashews, they can do it using mobile money and they can know who's got the product to sell. So we're certainly going to see much more of the emergence of digital marketing platforms. Then there's the one about information. Farmers have been operating blind. They don't realize what markets are closed off. They are uncertain of what the health implications of COVID. And um, we've done our own surveys of this and found that farmers are using their phones for telephone calls as you would expect, but they are hardly using them for digital applications. And yet that's where the investment going. So what do they do? Actually, what the, the farmers in this region do do is they inhabit chat rooms. Somewhere between 20 and 40% are in chat rooms. And if we look at the commercial world, we see that they have used chat rooms and they have used influences in chat rooms to engage popularly the people in there in conversations about new products, technology, market information, it could be health information. That might be able to apply that to the agricultural space using the existing systems, not trying to create something new. And the other thing we've seen is live streaming is being really taken off. But the broader story is this. What particularly the donors are interested in, and the discussion that we will be encouraging is around two things. One is the enabling environment for digital to happen much better. Most countries have a system in which mobile telephone companies have to provide a small portion of their turnover to a fund, which is meant to have been applied to investing in the rural digital Wi-Fi infrastructure. Mostly that hasn't happened. Certainly 10 years ago, there was, there was over a billion dollars in, in a fund in India, which had not been used. The interesting thing is, can we mobilize those kind of funds to be able to enable farmers to have access to the internet and be able to have broadband access? And the same thing is this one about that if we are going to be able to service the farming sector with um, subsidies, targeted subsidies, time-limited subsidies, information, and so on and so forth, we need to have a registry of farmers. And this doesn't exist at the moment. If we knew who was a farmer, who was a landlord, who's a tenant, where their land is, and being able to give them each a unified uni identifier number. This would facilitate this digital platforms that we're expecting to see emerge. So what we're aiming to build out from the COVID crisis is to build out better and to leave behind a system that smallholder farmers are plugged into a rapidly modernizing and expanding food um, sector. You know, one thing to bear in mind that the food purchases are going up at over 6% per year, which means that they will double over the next decade, which is a huge flow of money that will come out of the urban consumer. And unless we get it right, that money will be spent on importing food. But if we can get it right with a modernized um, farming system, enabling the younger, better farmers to participate, we have a, a hope for a much more prosperous rural future. Over. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Graham. I think you touched uh, 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 various different aspects and uh, how important the technology is. And I, I know there are some places, uh, uh, there's a, you know, Uber-like revolution happening, but um, there's a quite a bit of a penetration of technology that we have never seen in the human history, especially with the mobile that uh, reached uh, the bottom of the pyramid and you know where most of the smallholder farmers are in the margins um, this mobile has made a huge impact and I think this is the time that we need to harness some of these technologies to build uh, very innovative models um, like uh, Uber you said how uh, it has impacted uh, public transportation so in that I have one question um, 
uh, I think, uh, how do you think agribusiness and small farmers um, will approach digital technology in next uh, few years? You know, um, I know you said there's a lot of potential, but how do you think uh, uh, is, uh, do you have any for, uh, like visualize how these are going to pan out in the next uh, couple of years? And then um, have you seen any best practices uh, uh, in the value chain players adopting the technology? You're muted, uh, Graham, you're muted. You asked two questions there. You know, what, what are the yeah. examples of technology um, being able to reach the bottom of the pyramid? Yeah. Um, uh, and then, you know, how do I expect to see farming develop? So let me right. start with the first one. Um, we, we recently managed to convene a fascinating conversation between the private sector in Myanmar and the World Bank around how the private sector could be crowded into their future project. And, and one of the companies there really surprised us. Um, because it, you know, this was a company selling input seeds, fertilizer, um, and they casually mentioned that they now sold to 3.5 million farmers, which is half mm -hmm. of all the farmers in Myanmar. And wow. a half a million of them had download applications. And wow. yes, they had e-vouchers already operating. Um, they were using drones. They were looking at precision agriculture. You know, this, uh, this in indicates there's a lot more happening, as you indicated, than we realize. We just have right. to make sure uh, uh, there is a great line about the future's already here, um, albeit rather patchy. And that's wh what we're seeing. How do I expect farming to develop? Well, I, you know, there are different scenarios. You know, there is the one about, you know, some, lots of very small farmers, organic farming and so on and so forth. The one we are, then you've got, you know, big farms and then you've got this sort of industrialization of farming. But the one that we think is the most inclusive and the most likely to really deliver on demand is the emergence of a cadre of younger, better, and more professional farmers. And if they are going, if you're going to keep these younger people in the far, in the space, they will want to stay there because they can make a good living out of it. And that is certainly around increases in productivity. And you have companies like CP, the largest buyer in the maze in the world, talking about. Um, the needs of uh, irrigating farming to be able to get feed crops a year. So we are certainly looking to see um, that cadre of younger, better farmers emerge and surrounding them a network of businesses that will be providing services to them. And we're seeing them already. I mean, Myanmar, there is a, a company being able to deliver tractor services, doing the plowing for them. Um, there are over 20,000 drone operators operating in China who do um, spraying services. You certainly, when, when labor becomes short, um, one of the things you've seen elsewhere in the world is the emergence of um, labor gangs, where people bring in gangs to harvest the mangoes, so that we expect to see surrounding the farming sector, a network of businesses that provide services to avoid them having to make the lumpy investment. There's no point in having a tractor if you've only got 10 hectares. It makes much more sense to bring someone else to do the plan. So that's my sort of mental image. Over. Thank you, Graham. Um, I have a couple of questions from audience. I'll try to combine them. Yeah. Um, so one quick uh, question is how, uh, what is that Grow India could learn from Grow Asia? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, in Bangladesh, there's a huge price gap uh, from producer to consumer level. Mm. How to minimize the price gap and how to benefit to our farmers. Uh, mm. So the middleman issue, I think this is mm. probably uh, everywhere exists uh, in some form or the other. Yeah. So I think it's about uh, okay. addressing the middleman. And then uh, uh, one uh, last one. Yeah, the rural logistics is a real problem uh, in India. Mm. And the way to integrate disparate logistics, have you seen the transit application from CSIRO Australia? Do you think something like that would work in India? So I, I don't know that certain specific uh, thing is asking, but yeah, so please, no, if you fine. could get light on uh, quickly on a few yeah. things, yeah. Uh, great questions. Um, yeah. You know, the, the first one is, you know, about Grow India and Grow Asia. Um, you know, what, we, we are a network with Grow Africa, Grow India, there's something happening in, in Central America and the exchange of good practices. We learn things from India as they can learn things for us. If, we, if you stopped and said, what have we really learned? 
Um, the, the, the first one is that people that we get to bring together multi-stakeholder partnerships. And there is a sort of myth that partnerships are a good thing. So they're like Apple Pie, they're like Apple Pie and motherhood, they're a good thing. Um, and then the assumption is they're easy. They're not, you know, half of them fail. And so that there is a whole world of, of building up expertise is how do you get when somebody from an input supplier is sitting in around a table with someone from a farmer's cooperative from the Ministry of Agriculture, um, from an off taker to get them to actually come together and realize what is their common problem and how they can work together. There's a huge level around that. And the second one is around that it's very easy in the de development space to do boutique projects and change the lives of you know, 200, 300 farmers. That doesn't move the needle. You have to work at scale. And often it starts with a small project and it builds to scale. And the third piece that we've learned is that if you're going to deliver, there's that wonderful aphorism about you can think globally, but you have to act locally. And yeah. an, an example of that is in Vietnam where they uh, introduced good agricultural practices, 2000 farmers trained, that's only half a percent. It was when it went um, to a national one and they replicated and mirrored at the local level, the, the, the structure of public private sector partnerships, that's when the delivery got, that's when they delivered um, training to over 110,000 farmers. So that was that one. Then um, the, 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 the price gap. Now, the, you know, the thing to understand about price gap is that normally what has been happening is that you have, you're a very small trader and you buy you know, 100 kilos of product and then you sell it down the line to somebody who's, buy, who's now got 500 kilos and he sells it. So there are lots and lots of transactions. You've only got 100 kilos of product. You have to have a large margin to be able to make a living of it. So, but what you are seeing, and this is summarized by a really nice work called The Quiet Revolution, which is that there is something happening, particularly at the cutting edge, that it's, it, the, the big word is disintermediation. It basically means that there is the emergence of a cadre of better, larger traders. And so in Assam, for example, we found that there was a huge increase in the sale in hot markets. And when we got there, we realized that it was because that now the roads had been built and, 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 trucker, and trucker traders had cell phones. They could go into the market and they could phone up their customers and say they've got some really good carrots. So that 10 ton trucker trader was now buying in the hat market mm -hmm. and it had turned into a wholesale market. So you've seen how digital will work through that. And then the final of that question, I think that the CSIRO is a very interesting one. There is in India, mm -hmm. There is also an application which I think 1.1 lakh um, farmers have been integrated, um, truckers of six different countries of companies have been integrated together. There is an application in South Africa, which is called the Backhaul, which is to encourage that. I'm sure out there, there will be these kind of things. We certainly saw in Senegal, an application which enabled gum Arabic farmers to be able to stay where their gum Arabic was so that tra traders could be able to map out a sensible, route to collect and buy those products. Over. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, that, that's a, a, a very good uh, uh, response and I think we should move on. Uh, okay. Thank you, Graham. Thank thanks you, Venkat. Uh, yeah. Thanks everyone and, for your attention. Yeah, Jerry, uh, please, uh, it's all yours now. So you have eight okay. minutes. Thank uh, you, Venkat. Seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon once again. As I said earlier, uh, I'll, I'll be speaking more of uh, what we're doing in two countries, and this is the Philippines and Myanmar. And just to give you a context of, uh, of these two countries in terms of our programs, because then I'll use that as a basis to say what we have done during COVID and what's the plan, what is the intervention after COVID, post-COVID. So for Philippines and Myanmar, uh, IFA does uh, investments of... Uh, about $250 million, it's about 90 million in Myanmar, 150 million in the Philippines. And uh, for these two countries, uh, the projects that uh, we implement, that is being, impl we finance and being implemented by government are uh, essentially uh, targeted into rural sectors and communities of, uh, in agriculture, in fisheries, and particularly smallholders, fishers, uh, indigenous peoples, and ethnic groups. No? And uh, these days with IFAD most IFAD projects are utilizing value chain approach 
uh, definitely uh, COVID-19 has, has disrupted and impacted negatively the implementation of these projects as well as the functioning of the value chains, the supply chains that these projects have supported. And uh, for example, in the Philippines, we have projects in fisheries, we have projects in the uplands, we have projects uh, in, uh, in the lowlands, and uh, we, we have several, uh, several interventions for production, uh, processing, marketing, and capacity building for these uh, communities that are being supported. In Myanmar, it's actually the same projects, but more focused on basic infrastructure and irrigation systems. And uh, so in COVID, uh, this, uh, this past few months, and even until now, what IFAD has, uh, has done is to support government uh, to repurpose existing projects, you know, to adjust strategies and implementing activities for ongoing projects to be able to quickly uh, support governments in responding to COVID challenges, particularly in uh, aspects like loss of income for uh, rural uh, farmers, for smallholders, and uh, the disruptions in the supply chain and the value chain, no? production, transportation, and logistics. Uh, repurposing because for us it's quicker to, to provide support to government. It doesn't entail a lot of changes in terms of uh, programmatic and project designs. So that's, that's ongoing and uh, in the Philippines particularly we're talking with the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources where we have an existing investment project in uh, several regions that will now uh, provide support more on livelihoods for uh, small fishers that they can uh, boost production on fisheries and then in turn uh, help these communities uh, adopt simple uh, systems of uh, refrigeration and logistics that can bring products to urban centers. As, as you know, uh, the Philippines, uh, when it had a lockdown, Manila, Metro Manila was severely affected and supply of food and uh, fishery products has been uh, curtailed. And so from, lesson, from the lessons of this uh, crisis and pandemic, government thought that it's worthwhile to really invest in uh, providing logistics and uh, uh, systems of transportation to bring products to urban areas. In Myanmar, uh, the way we are supporting government to respond to COVID-19 is to repurpose a certain project that uh, is being implemented by the Department of Rural Development for such project to provide uh, support on cash for work arrangements for communities. So it can be on production activities, it can also be in small infrastructure activities where uh, certain uh, communities can help and they are paid for cash for work and uh, because of uh, disruptions of income. So these are ongoing activities and hopefully in a uh, in a, in a short period, we'll be able to uh, put this in motion. Uh, additionally, also, I have to mention that in the Philippines, uh, we are supporting government in uh, small, uh, medium, uh, micro and small financing where government now has uh, implemented uh, financing programs even with zero interest rate. And so one of the projects that we have right now that's implemented by the Trade and Industry Department uh, is being repurposed also to be able uh, to respond to a financing program that is appropriate for smallholders in the commodities that uh, this uh, BTI implemented project supports. So that's also ongoing. Now, uh, let me go to post-COVID. And here, uh, I'd like to talk about the IFAD Rural Poor Stimulus Facility or the RPSF. And this is, this is a very recent facility that uh, IFAD has, uh, has launched. And the, uh, the whole idea, the objective is to improve the food security and resilience of poor and rural people affected by the crisis. And uh, initially, this is going to be implemented in 59 countries where we operate. Nine of these countries are in the Asia Pacific region and Myanmar is one of those countries. And the way the IFAD selected the countries is through this uh, COVID-informed risk index of OCHA. And so that's, that's the basis of the selection of these countries. And this facility will be requested and implemented by governments, but implementation can be in collaboration or partnership, say with farmers organizations, with NGOs, and even private sector where they can add value. And 
this that there are essentially four areas where the facility can respond. One is the provision of inputs and basic assets for production. So these are provision of uh, uh, assets and, and uh, uh, production uh, inputs for crops, livestock, fisheries, and for small scale producer to be able to maintain their adequate production. The second area where the, uh, the fund can respond is on facilitating access to market. Again, logistics uh, to be able to help smallholders avoid the uh, losses in production and uh, transportation. And even uh, interventions in facilitating safe and hygienic uh, transport uh, arrangements no, to ensure that market, markets remain open. The third area would be to provide support on targeted funds to preserve services, markets, and jobs for the poor uh, rural people. And essentially, we will do this through existing financial institutions already working with small-scale producers and small and medium enterprises. And so uh, such intervention like uh, having long gestating loan programs and uh, uh, low interest, zero interest loan programs can be one of those uh, potential uh, areas for support. Last but not the least, which is uh, a very exciting uh, trend these days and that has been mentioned also by Graham, is delivering agriculture-related information through digital services. And uh, the, whole, the idea is to facilitate up-to-date information on production, weather, market prices, uh, given the lack of extension and the traditional information channels in rural areas. And we have all witnessed how COVID-19 has affected uh, this, uh, the disruptions in, in these areas. So uh, this, is, this is a facility that's open and in its ongoing. And I'd like to cite particularly uh, the, the proposal of the government of Myanmar, uh, the Department of Agriculture for this facility, which is again, very exciting is, uh, but this is still in the development stage, is the use of mobile technology for agri-extension services for market access and financial services. Uh, Graham has noted that indeed there, there is a growing robust uh, sector in Myanmar that's uh, moving into uh, 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 online or uh, uh, financial services with the use of digital technology and we'd like to capture this. And so in the next few months while the, the proposal is being developed, this is going to be uh, uh, implemented in collaboration with, with the private sector, with existing providers already, if there are, of such kind of, of services. And, and for us, this is very exciting because COVID or no COVID, in the long run, this is the way to go for making uh, services in the agriculture sector more efficient. So I'll end there. Uh, if uh, there are questions, I'd be willing to, uh, to respond to them, Venkat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. That was very helpful about it. Uh, country specific. Uh, oh, mate, I think I uh, country specific information. So, uh, just uh, one quick uh, question: How do you, um, you know, the supply chains are becoming critical for addressing food security, right? And uh, also, I think what you have said is uh, basically distribution. So um, what are the models you see evolving in uh, public-private partnerships? And what is the scope uh, there for private players and the public to enhance their role in this space? In, in, well, particularly for the Philippines, we're looking in the fishery sector, we're looking at the uh, private sector uh, in partnership with local governments and the producers organizations to be able to manage such facilities because uh, in the context of the Philippines, uh, especially in terms of these facilities being managed by, by government, may not be uh, so efficient in the long run. No? Issues of, uh, of uh, uh, ownership, issues of management come into play. For IFAD, what is clear is that such facilities are owned by communities. In so doing, uh, the management, of course, will be difficult at the start if, if, if you give it to that's where uh, That's where the private sector can come in, no? giving them the, the, uh, the opportunity to manage uh, such facilities because uh, that, that's, that's the way to go. But in terms of equitable uh, arrangements and ownership, it's got to be very clear that uh, uh, certain, uh, certain uh, 
benefits uh, trickle or go to the communities, not only in terms of being able to access these services, but to be able to, to share with uh, the profits that comes out from, from these facilities. So that's, that, that's, one, uh, that's one example okay. we're looking at, management by the private sector. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I just have a couple of questions from the audience. Maybe uh, I'll just combine them. Uh, first one, you know, what percentage of agri-credit is through institutional credit? Uh, and what would be production credit versus post-harvest credit ratio? Is there any interest rate subsidy from government? That's one question. And uh, uh, I think you talked about the fisheries. Uh, somebody want a, um, what kind of a logistics support uh, smallholder farmers can get, the logistics support for fisheries smallholder farmers. Um, and uh, the, the third question, uh, because you are very keenly involved in Myanmar, uh, Myanmar is eager to expo, uh, extend exports to Southeast Asia uh, in rice, peas, and vegetables, and mango. And uh, I've had, uh, I think, Apraka also he mentioned, but uh, we can talk for soon later. But his IFAD could assist in agri financing and food innovation. So, just uh, if you can touch base on those three quickly, that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Now, very quickly, on the ratio for financing on production and uh, the other aspects of the value chain, I'm afraid I don't have the figures. But if you ask me about the rates, uh, you know, interest rate is always a uh, uh, controversial issue, if, if I may call it, no? Uh, because, uh, of course, communities would always want uh, lower rates of, uh, of, of borrowing. But then uh, you have to deal with institutions who have cost, you know, cost of lending. So uh, the way IFAD supports projects in pre-COVID situation is to go by what is uh, bearable uh, by, the, by the farmers and what, is, uh, what the market dictates. No? and uh, to, to, to find uh, that particular uh, point where you know, farmers and institutions uh, would be able to meet is uh, for IFAD to support uh, public institutions to deploy risk mitigating, uh, risk mitigating programs such as uh, crop insurance, such as guarantee funds, no? so that uh, financing institutions are able to, to, to manage risk. And then in, uh, in turn, uh, risk, uh, rates wouldn't really come out that high for for communities. So that's that that's the way we we handle such kind of issue. Uh, for Myanmar, uh, I'm not too sure of the particularity of the question, but talking about uh, these particular crops on rice, fish, and vegetables, if I may speak about the projects that uh, government in, in Myanmar that is being uh, financed by IFAD. The central region, uh, which is the rice area of the one of the rice areas of the country, that's the uh, Nepido area, and and definitely rice is an important commodity in Myanmar. And even I think uh, you're very well aware that Myanmar is uh, formally or informally exporting rice to China. So that's that that's uh, that's the opportunity there. On fit on rice uh, on vegetables, uh, some of the communities that we have supported in this area are starting to link or even, even in fact link already with certain exporters and processors in Japan. So it's, it's an example that we're, we're trying to replicate in as much areas as uh, in, the, in that region. Two other projects that we have, which is implemented in the Eastern states and Western states of the country are barely starting, but most of these projects, most of the interventions would revolve around agroforestry and the high value crops and commodities like coffee, uh, like uh, uh, elephant food yam, you know, and such other uh, high value products. In two to three years time, uh, we would see improved, hopefully improved production that then would merit uh, capacity for surplus production, whether for processing in country or, you know, export it to, to other countries outside of Myanmar. Although the fact is that uh, right now, uh, I think certain records would bear that uh, even as, you know, Previous years, Myanmar is already exporting some of its uh, some of its vegetable and and uh, crops now, and I say that with certainty because I'm surprised even that mung bean is one of those products that's being exported by Myanmar to to the Philippines. So there seems to be trade going on, but to what extent is this uh, 
uh, being supported both at production and trade and the export destination. That's something that we need to figure out uh, what is really the, the status of uh, such uh, uh, trading system of these commodities. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, that's a uh, very good, uh, uh, you know, I think information. So without further ado, can we go to uh, Isabel? Isabel, it's all yours. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really appreciate the, um, the presentation and talks from Graham and Jerry. And I would like to rebound in particular on, on something Graham said before. So as I have said before, ID Capital, my activity is fully into innovation and most often tech-driven innovation. And I really realize and I'm fully aware that tech is only part of the equation. But I tell you one thing which I really found very interesting in Graham's um, presentation. This notion of having a young, better farmer making a very decent living through novel ways of doing agriculture for me is absolutely essential. Um, I believe in the, in the infectious power of such a young farmer succeeding. And what does it mean succeeding? It doesn't mean insane amount of money. It just means living the life he wants to live, yet being a farmer. And because the, we all know the farmers are getting older, we have this issue of making agriculture attractive for the younger generation. So for me, technology is also serving the dual purpose of attracting younger talents. It's not just solving problems, it's attracting people who are going to solve the problems. In the context of COVID-19, where have we seen technology helping? In many places. And I don't deny that there is an important role the government have to play and they have played this role. But more specifically, when we were working on the notion of food resilience, we've noted four key areas. Three of them have been discussed before. They are not new to you. But let me just delve into it again. Access to labor, in particular when mobility is an issue. Access to market, in particular when, when logistics is disrupted. Access to cash, as we've said before. There is a fourth one, which is also very important, I think. Everybody knows that when COVID broke, the first line of defense for farmers, like for all of us, has been to have a healthy immune system. And I would like to insist on the importance of um, proper nutrition for farmers, solutions that can be brought to them so that they are healthy and fit and they can cope. So we see really uh, food resilience as a very holistic concept. And in particular, if I look at, if I narrow down to Southeast Asia, I would like to say that for us, Southeast Asia was the very natural extension area for people like us living in Singapore. We also came to realize that when it comes to agri-tech innovation, Southeast Asia is catching up with China and India at the moment, just focusing on, on, on Asia. Catching up, it used to be a little slow. And if there is one silver lining to COVID-19, I would really hope that it will accelerate Southeast Asia digital convergence. There is this quote from the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, who was saying that we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months. He was not talking about agriculture. He was talking about businesses, ERP, SaaS, and likes. But I would really hope that the same applies to agriculture. Very interestingly, lots of innovation that you could think of implementing in South Asian countries are stumbling across the same roadblock, which is IT infrastructure not so much usage, but really IT infrastructure. For instance, when you're trying to digitize uh, farmland and to get a bit more data, to be able to inform a bit um, better the decision you're taking as a farmer, you realize that the level of digitization of farmland is very, very often below 5%. When you touch on smaller farmers categories, it's very often below 1%. And more interestingly, this figure is difficult to get. Very interestingly and very tellingly, you would see um, in Vietnam, for instance, the Vietnam Digital Agriculture Association starting to really boost industry 4.0 goals and digital transformation. You would see in Thailand 3.3 billion earmarked to boost digitization of Thai, Thai agriculture. I really hope this will be one of the benefits of the current situation. 
Moving on to the question that has been addressed to me through different channels, I'm trying to squint on my, on my screen. I see there is this question of food safety and traceability. And it's very interesting that it comes from the audience because as you know, we've been for four years, we've been throwing this big Asia Pacific wide startup competition, early stage startup. This year again, we had 150 startups. We come the uh, region and we look in a very structured manner at innovation through the lenses of 20 odd categories, like, you know, farm to fork, like agri-financing and, and the likes. Within these 20 categories, one of them has been consistently trending. That's the one on food safety and traceability. Very interesting because if you look at the Western countries, the more developing markets, this is not really a sector which is very exciting for most people and investors, but in the context of Asia, whether it's for the last mile or the first mile where issues are very, very different, food safety and traceability have come hand in hand. Um, so yes, there, there is room for innovation and I would really expect the current situation to boost appetite for it. Then we were talking about entrepreneurs and the infectious power of successful entrepreneurs. I would like also to maybe um, shed some light on this myth of venture capital. And I don't want to destroy the myth of venture capital. I would just like to say that it's not the only solution. Startups have developed in the recent years and the models like Uber and some others have not helped in that respect. They've developed this habit of thinking of the money raised more than just the clients. And I would like to stress the fact that um, when it comes to agriculture, I see many smart solutions coming from very smart people that don't really shine because of the novelty of the technology itself. The tech is out there, it's a smart way to use it, but it's not something very disruptive per se, but a combination of an understanding of the local context, the right connections, the right understanding of who is ready to pay for what. It's not just that it can work, it is, I'm coming up with a traceability solution. I'm coming up with an app. Who will be paying for this along the value chain? By the way, it's not always the smallholder farmers. It might be it's another- a One minute, huh? One minute. So my, my last point of conclusion was to say for all the very young and energetic talents willing to innovate in that space, think a bit broader than just venture capital money. Venture capital investors are hardwired to look at barriers to entry, things that are really defensible, things that cannot be replicated by somebody else. Think of customer money. Think about designing a business model where you get the cash in. We spoke about the cash before. It doesn't make any difference whether you're a young entrepreneur or established farmer. Cash is really important, in particular in, in difficult situations. So my last point was to say, yes, there is funding for food safety and traceability, and I really believe the current situation will accelerate this. But think of various kind of funding and think of various kind of business models that will be palatable to different kind of funding pockets. Okay, um, that's, that's uh, thank you very much. I think a very good uh, perspective from the, I think venture capital and how the innovation, uh, private innovation is being funded. Um, I, I will actually pick a, a quick question from the audience. What is the potential of investment in automation and uh, smart food safety systems in the post-COVID era in Southeast Asia? Is the Southeast Asian market mature enough beyond uh, Singapore? Can you answer that, please? Every country I have seen, in every country I have seen, governments have redefined the notion of food resilience. Very often in this redefinition, there is an impetus on local production and local consumption. Because of this, it tends to redefine the needs and the priorities in terms of investment. Very often, it does benefit food safety and security uh, investment. So there is more funding going in that space. It doesn't mean it's always venture capital funding. It can be ground funding, it can be government funding, it can be public-private partnerships funding, and there are multiple outlets there which needs to come together very often to fund these innovations. Yeah, and um, how is uh, any any um, evaluation, re-evaluation of um, uh, the VC community, uh, what you're seeing the trends uh, with the post-COVID? I mean, 
one thing emerged is uh, ag and food has become very, very, very uh, prominent uh, space in the whole discussion of, uh, you know, uh, everywhere, right? That has become one single most important thing on everybody's mind, how to get your food um, every day. And in that situation, um, how is the venture capital, you know, funders are thinking about this sector? So we have small and, and growing evidence that the VC investors are looking at it more than before. The momentum was already there before COVID, but it was more based on this kind of fashionable um, IPOs like Beyond Meat. You now what is really making a very big difference is the focus on the hardcore business of growing food in the, in, in the lands. How will it shape the uh, VC investment and the reaction of investors? It's a little early to say, but what I, I can tell for sure is that these investors, they want to hear and they want to see a growth story. Most of the innovations we see in that space are not, as I said, they are not shining because the innovation is absolutely disruptive. Nobody had thought of it before. They shine because they start small somewhere. Their proof of concept is a proof of success and they grow from there. So the kind of reasoning a private equity investor usually applies to a business it's, he's looking at, like, you know, where is the bottom line? Where is the top line? And what kind of growth can I expect with more capital injecting the company? We see VC investors applying it at an early stage on young startups, which of course is very tough for um, entrepreneurs because they are at the stage where they are trying to get their pipeline, they are trying to get repeat sales, and it's very early. But I would really like to encourage them to think cash to cash cycle and early adopters, as opposed to just being obsessive about knowing whether the investor like this sort of thing. You sell investors a growth story, they'll come. They really come. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel. Um, that's, I think, uh, very good um, insights uh, in what's going on. So uh, we will go next to Dina. Dina, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, uh, Ben Kat. Um, so as uh, Graham had mentioned, um, the COVID-19 pandemic really exposed a lot of the weaknesses on the food distribution and food logistics, but it's also exposed also the importance of, of good nutrition. As you know, if you are, uh, if you have pre-existing conditions, you're also more uh, susceptible to the bad effects of COVID-19. So right now when we look at what is happening, I, I think the logistical problems are easing because governments are learning about green channels, how to do it. And now what we are talking about is economic recovery. So how do we help the farmers who are affected? How do we help the enterprises who are affected survive the impacts of the COVID-19? So as we focus on what we call a healthy economy, which is recovery, I really want to say that we should also look at the other aspects, which is a healthy planet and a healthy people in terms of what we do uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, because what we don't want to do is you know, continue some of the, the not so great practices that we have had in East Asia, where our productivity increases have been at the expense of increasing degradation of our resources. We have soil degradation, we're running out of water, the salinity of the water uh, in the areas, and people are, 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 are eating just uh, very starchy foods, no diversified uh, diets, and so now all these kind of uh, non-communicable diseases are happening. So this is, I think, what uh, 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 Brooke saying that you know, let's not let an, a crisis go to waste. We really need to build better. And, and therefore, I think in the programs that, that we are, are looking at, we do want to help with the recovery, but we also want to look at environmental sustainability, but also improving uh, nutrition of our people um, in East Asia and the Pacific. So how are, are we doing this? So in many ways, uh, an important vehicle that we are using as a platform is really to start with organizing the millions of smallholder farmers in East Asia. So start with producer groups and use that as a platform to deliver better, better services. So what do I mean? So let me just give the example of Myanmar, which uh, Graham had mentioned, where we're dealing with emergency but also medium and longer term uh, challenges. 
So we have a project that's going to go to the board tomorrow, actually. Um, so a lot of it, about 100, for the 200, about $100 million is really to help farmers recover because, because of the disruption, they were not able to get fertilizers and seeds and um, et cetera. So it will include a voucher, an e-voucher. So, so as not, the government had wanted to distribute seeds and fertilizer. I said, we said, no, that's really not a good idea. <laughs> One of which alter to the farmers, and then they will buy the input from the private sector, and there we develop the input supply sector as well. So we're also working towards the strengthening extension services through e-extension. We want to use SMS, instant messaging, video, uh, TVs, um, also to spread and strengthen the, the extension service. So in the short term, to include how to do hand washing, how to do social distancing. But in the future, also include adoption of climate smart drought resistant varieties, um, pest resistant varieties, uh, biofortified foods, such as nutrition, in, in good soil management, uh, soil water management, etc. So it's really important for us not to us to lose the you know the end game. We want to ensure food security, but we want to do it in a sustainable way. So we're doing the same thing in Mongolia, for example, in our livestock commercialization project. There are a lot of herders. They're dispersed all over the country. They need to also in, increase uh, productivity and quality of, of the livestock because they're also some of the poorest. Uh, how do we increase your income by helping them be better? Um, and so mo most of them are actually having organic meats. So we're trying to help them now how to uh, 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 improve the productivity of their livestock, strengthen the capacity of these herders through groups for food safety, vaccination, etc., and therefore be able to eventually, if we have a traceability system established also for them to export um, organic meat in the future and therefore have a sustainable livestock system that's exporting our organic uh, meat. So uh, in terms of, uh, I think, value chain development, as we increase productivity, we also need to link the group to the market. So we try to aim to establish productive partnerships. Um, and Grow Asia is helping us with this one, is to bring private sector and the producer groups together so they can have uh, uh, the market. The, the groups help them to be able to meet the volume requirements and the quality requirements food safety requirements that can then help link them to the farmers. Um, and finally, we're also uh, piloting innovative financing uh, mechanisms. For example, in, in China, uh, we have this new project, the Henan Green Agriculture Fund. Uh, it's basically working with the Henan Agriculture uh, Development Fund Investment Corporation. The idea is this fund will invest either in equity or lending to companies that will do green agriculture. So actually either you know, using solar technology, uh, pollution control um, uh, methods um, for, for, for livestock, uh, for example. So it's really important to, to focus, like I said, on the long term that we should uh, do a more sustainable agriculture while we deal with the short term um, emergencies. So let me stop there and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dina. Thank you. Um, that's very helpful. So, um, you know, because you work with the governments as part of the World Bank and, um, you know, what are you uh, seeing the policy, different policy pushes from, I mean, different governments uh, that are, uh, you know, really innovative and uh, having a, an impact on agriculture and uh, especially smallholder farmer uh, that could be emulated in other parts of the, you know, region. Yeah, uh, I, I think now the policy is just the recognition that you that the millions of farmers cannot really survive on their own, mm. and that they have more power if they are grouped together. So there's a lot of kind of emphasis now. On, on organizing uh, producer groups. Um, it is easier to deliver extension services uh, for them to take advantage of government programs because then you can help them you know, build their capacity to stronger extension services using digital technologies and other technologies. 
um, uh, they you can build help help them build capacity also to prepare bankable proposals. Mm. So some of them, for example, uh, want to do you know to get better prices, they have to invest in a dryer, a drying system, right? So they have to. Uh, we may be able to provide them matching grants through the project. But then they have to take the money elsewhere from the bank. So then you can provide them technical assistance to get them to get some bank, what we call bankable uh, proposals. And we do that also in supporting some small and medium enterprises. So, so I think now is, is the recognition that, you know, government doesn't have to do everything <laughs> for yeah, the yeah. farmer. You do the marketing, do the trading, do the extension. But it's really now the openness to say, hey, look, we can just provide the financing and then we can work in partnership with the private sector to provide extension services, do the trading, do the marketing, and they should just be more on the, the regulation and doing research, um, uh, more the public goods, like irrigation, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, okay, so one, one question from the audience. Um, see, India has uh, implemented this direct benefit transfer program to, for the farmers right instead of giving input subsidy and all that um so but uh, i think some research says uh, there's a mixed results you know farmers are not really using that money for agriculture uh do you have any uh, thoughts on uh, what is your opinion on direct benefit transfer uh, related to agriculture okay so the direct benefit transfer oftentimes is they say better <laughs> because it, it's less distortive right because if the government is delivering inputs, fertilizer, seeds, etc., they often get that they often deliver the wrong kind, uh, the wrong time, and really bad quality. So, so the idea is just to just give them a, a, a direct uh, a, a transfer, so then you know the farmers can do what they want to buy the necessary inputs and investments. However. Doing that independently without helping the capacity of farmers to determine how they will use it <laughs> becomes a problem. Because if they feel that, okay, but then, you know, my, 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 my yield are very low, I don't have a market, um, I have losses, huge losses, they will not use it for that purpose. So it's really, it's, it's like, it's not a magic bullet. It has to be combined with additional uh, support services in terms of, I mean, on the production side, but also on the marketing side, because in the end, you know, farmers, they are smart. They would only do things that would give them more money or more income. And if they don't see the benefit, then, of course, they will not use the money for for how the government had originally in, envisioned it. And, and there are many uh, so and there are many experiences, for example, in other countries in Turkey, Latin America, where it shows that, you know, it has to be a package. And it cannot just be give money away because that that won't work so well. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dina. That's um, I think uh, all we have uh, questions, uh, and uh, I think we're saving the last, but uh, it's the best, I think. <laughs> uh, Dr. Prasoon Das, uh, uh, yeah. So please, it's all yours. And uh, so thank you very much. To all my fellow panelists, I think uh, being the last uh, speaker, my job is a little better uh, because all of you have done uh, majority of the things you have covered. But what I, I am planning here, because I, I know that I'm the last uh, no speaker, so I would like to give you some ground realities. Because as you know, we work with the financial institution, national level, central banks, and even some of the MFIs. So what? what uh, actually they did and what problem they faced and what is the basically the few prescription for them where we can work together in, including World Bank, IFAD, our uh, source trace and all other partners we can work together. So the first, uh, uh, the major thing what we found that there is a uh, problem or no, uh, uh, there is an issue of this COVID-19. But the question is that everybody has considered it as a problem of, of agriculture or for, for that matter for all sectors. But when you go to the deeper to the agriculture, when we did a survey, what we found that everybody is talking about agriculture and nobody has gone deeper into the subsectors of agriculture. Mm. 
So that is a very big problem what we are facing, our financial institutions are facing. To whom they will fund it's more, whether it is a crop, smallholder, somebody is writing a question on the smallholder, but smallholder doesn't mean always the crop producer. There might be a two cattle holder, might be a 10 coat holder. So who actually affected most? So there is no index and none of the government is trying to understand or find out what, which particular subsector of agriculture has been affected most. So there is no blanket. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a you no know, blanket situation. No, it's not. So that is one. The second one is that the, all regions face problem, including Southeast Asia. But all the regions, the financial institutions face the major problem, which immediately need to be solved is the assets and liability mismatch. The banks are facing an asset liability mismatch where they are not getting the, uh, no, uh, the loans uh, recovered, number one. Their savings are not are forthcoming. So there is a big asset liability mismatch. Now some of the government also supporting the, because they are, uh, they are uh, like uh, as uh, Venkat was telling, that uh, there is a CBT, which is uh, no cash transfer and all. This is being gone through the banks, so some liquidity is coming. But yep. this is not the liquidity we want. In the bank, we want a real liquidity which actually can support financing agriculture or because some of the agriculture sector, you know, if it is if it is an investment, it, it goes for a longer time. So we need that kind of an investment. That is the second. The third one, which is also very important, that no that all the banks have changed their uh, operating system, which has to be you know, accepted. And we must congratulate our financiers. They have to change their operating system and from the manuals, more, most of them have gone to the uh, virtual basis. Now, what, what is the uh, basic risk in virtual uh, financing to the uh, rural sector? So we talk about innovation in technology is fine, good enough, fair enough, but we have we to factor the risk for the rural sector. So the rural sector, fact, uh, I mean, uh, innovation for rural sector in, 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 in technology has to be factored in while they will take through their risk analysis. Mm -hmm. Then comes that what actually we are going to get when we are uh, the, the responses of the financial institutions. They have two major issues they have. Yes. On the financials, as I said already, that the address of them mitigate the short drop in their asset value. All the financial institutions in the region has a sharp drop in their asset value, which immediately has to be uh, addressed. I, we don't know how to do that, but it has to be addressed. The second one is the operational issues. As I, as I already mentioned, the operational issues from manual to virtual and how the risk are being transferred. So these two major issues they face. Because why I, I, I can say, because we have a survey for all our member institutions across the region, where we found there are very good things, there are, there are great things are coming up, but, the, but sometimes the least card you no know, actually looming larger than, than the work they have done. Now, one, one of the issues which have been you now flagged by majority of our financial institutions are that most of our countries do not have a credit guarantee mechanism system. Most of them are having credit guarantee, but that is mainly, that is mainly for the MSME sector. But what about the smallholder part, whether they are covered under the guarantee? Some of the small, low, like World Bank project or maybe EFAD project do have credit guarantee, but it is not covering the entire sector. So that is one of the major uh, issues they face. The second major issue is the insurance. Do we have to change the insurance program or we need to take into consideration some of the things in the ins uh, insurance? Like, in most of the countries in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia, they do not have good livestock insurance. Those they do have for the cattle, but not for the, 
for the chickens. So whether it is a it is an all inclusive. So there is no inclusive insurance program available in the Southeast Asia. Then uh, the third issue is uh, uh, definitely there is a uh, no establishment of the disaster disaster investment uh, fund. All are under the government, but it is it is a general disaster investment fund. But none is specifically for the agriculture. So that is another issue which we face, and and no no banks can no answer to that. Now coming to after these are the, these are the issues and the problems. But now I'll take only two minutes for a uh, no what are the prescriptions as for for us what we are expecting our financial institutions are going to do. That we we need a safety net. That is now for sure. Now, how the safety net will come? The trade, as we, as we were discussing the other day, that there is a problem of you no know, cross border trade in in Southeast Asia. Although Southeast Asia uh, uh, common economic uh, you know, issues are being discussed by Graham in in in, uh, in their uh, forums and all. So, what what is the what is that safety net? It should some is to come from the exim banks. So the exim banks in this particular region are not so active. So we need a act reactivated exim banks. That is one. The second one is the, as I said, that okay, push for digitization. <coughs> we are pushing for digitization, but we need to take into consideration the risk factor of pushing digitization to the rural areas. I think I'm done here. I have many other things to say, but I'm done here. I am ready to take the question. Yeah. Okay. That, that's uh, that's uh, very uh, helpful. Uh, you know, we have a few minutes for question and answer. Person, one question. Um, you know, you you work with uh, these microcredit organizations, right? And who have a really uh, a a good uh, a way of uh, collective uh, collectives, and they have a feet on the ground in the very rural area. Um, how do you see uh, them playing a role of aggregator? Um, because the smallholder farmers need to be somewhere or the other need to be aggregated uh, for, you know, we, we know the benefits of that. So do you think these microcredit organizations can also play a role of aggregator and how digital technologies could probably help in that endeavor? Could you throw some light on that? Yeah, uh, this is a very, actually, this is a very important question. I mean, we, we also discussed it in many forums. That say uh, first of all they uh, the small microcredit small uh, organization they do not have that kind of a capital to go for digitization, so they have to depend on a common service facilities, and most of the countries that do not allow these common service facilities to the microcredit agencies, so that is a, a big issue for us. Now the second major issue is that they can become an aggregator at a at a particular point of uh, place where there is a production uh, no, no point but if you if you see the consumption point is different than the production point then uh, there is no uh, the, uh, the area of that microcredit organization is not working so it is not a very you know coordinated effort for uh, being a uh, you know, aggregator but digital technology can definitely work for the microcredit organization only in case of the savings Allowing now getting uh, getting the savings from the uh, members is well, you can work on the digitization. But when you talk about the credit, because as I as you said rightly that uh, credit they need to have a you no know, uh, personal contact and very important touch point with them. So that is that these are the major issues we are facing with the micro credit agency. But we are we are working with the government to you know, support them to access that common digital platforms for them also. Okay. Um, one question from audience, you know, um, what kind of a risk assessment tools, uh, you know, they could be digital or not, uh, can banks use to determine credit worthiness? Um, what are the, some, I mean, this is establishing credit of farmers and, you know, is, is a big challenge most of the time. So what kind of uh, models have you seen uh, where uh, they could you know, objectively establish some uh, uh, you know, credit of uh, farmers and be comfortable in 
lending them. Former stock are all of them are credit worthy till <laughs> till the crop is in the field. The moment <laughs> crop is harvested, they are not at all credit worthy because the moment it is harvested, there is no marketing, so they become yeah. a beggar. Till the crop is in the field, they are the king. So you can have a lot of credit worthiness of the farmer, but the moment it is harvested, there is no credit worthiness because the market is not established at all. The market is depending on the many, many other factors. Uh, some of the countries, for example, India, even in, in Thailand also, in Vietnam as well, uh, that for particular uh, uh, crops, they have some uh, special uh, you know, uh, prices, which we call the minimum support price in other countries. So that when they establish that, you can use that as a, as a credit worthiness for them. So while at a, while doing a credit analysis for a farmer, it is not only that what uh, they are growing. Actually, we we are we have started talking about how to Uberize, uberization of agricultural you know assets uh, into a farmer's worthiness. So if you can uh, uberize those far, 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 uh, assets into uh, farmer's uh, credit worthiness, then the risk is minimized. Okay, that's a good answer. So let, we have a, like a few uh, minutes. I think we have, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I think they stick to their time, stuck to their time, and uh, uh, we still have a couple of minutes. So what I would like to do is, um, uh, you know, just go around and uh, one last thought. Maybe Prasun, I will start and I'll go in the reverse direction now. So you go ahead and just give one a quick uh, 30 seconds last thoughts on, uh, you know. Uh, my last thought is uh, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much uh, uh, no, no, no positive in this. I feel positive because the, it's, there are, there's a world beyond COVID-19. So the safe and behavior of the future of the world will be challenging. Uh, uh, that's true. But if our financial institution and the other you know, stakeholders work together, I mean, you know, most of the time they don't see each other also. So if they come and join together to you know, have a, a common uh, minimum you know, program for the farmers, for the, uh, for the all agri-food sector, then it can be excellent. Okay, thank you. Dina. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think for me, um, given that we're now into the recovery phase, uh, my only message is um, let's not only focus on the recovery. So we really need to look at the healthy economy and also push for a healthy planet and healthy people. So stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Isabel. Um, I think it's a time for hope and pride for farmers. And I think we should seize the momentum behind health workers. In many instances, I have noticed that they are, the, they are the new heroes and it's a very positive thing. It hasn't been easy for them, but I think we can really catch this situation as it is and do great things out of it. Thank you, Isabel. Jerry. Yeah, uh, just quickly and just to re-echo also to rejoin the earlier points, especially from Dina. Uh, Moving forward, uh, working with smallholder communities, the way to go, and even in the past, has always been to aggregate smallholders no, into associations because that's the more efficient way of doing it, providing extension services and um, being able to market and trade their products. And we're doing this in our projects in the Philippines and in Myanmar, whereby uh, ag aggregated smallholders work around an anchor firm that provides the market, which is also the same time as the technology provider. So in a post-COVID situation, these kind of models will become more important. And you put credit as part of the equation, whether it's through digital technology or you know, credit provided by local, uh, local institutions. So that, that framework will solidify, uh, so to speak, the approaches and the interventions needed so that you know, your supply chains for certain commodities continue to function anchored on strong communities that are able to produce the right quantity and quality that the consumer market needs. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry Graham. Okay. 
Uh, well, I think that I think the areas have been very nicely covered. I, I just uh, a thought came to mind, which was my, my son-in-law is a doctor, and for the last five years in his hospital, they've been arguing to the administration that they needed to move from paper records to electronic records. And for five years, nothing happened. Within two weeks of the COVID crisis, everything was electronic. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it is that thing that it now is a time of change and a time for some bold decisions. And I think coming out of this, there, there is the real chance that we can build back better. And that is an opportunity that doesn't happen very often. And it's an opportunity to be bold and courageous, but also thoughtful and to grab some of the incredible changes that are going afoot. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a good. So yeah, I mean, um, the, I want to thank all the speakers, panelists, and all the um, audience who joined. And one, my last thought, as Graham said, uh, I mean, we have about a little more than sixty employees, and forty plus of them used to be working at one office. And we made a decision to do remote working in a day, less than twenty-four hours. Uh, I decided on a Sunday. And then uh, Monday evening, everybody came to office and we said from Tuesday onwards, you're working from home and that's it. We don't see any difference right now. I'm thinking, why do I have an office? So, <laughs> 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 Seriously. Uh, so, I mean, the thing is the power of technology, the digitization, I think what Satya Nadella said is a, a tremendous transformation we have seen. And I think it's only going to be accelerated. And I think and one other important thing is the food and agriculture have been like at the, uh, the forefront or rather the center of the discussion of everybody, right? Uh, so like we never worried about getting our groceries, but that's one single most important thing we used to plan, you know, uh, especially the initial days. So uh, one thing that COVID has done, I know it has disrupted a lot of things and a lot of people lost lives. But on the other hand, it I think put a people's perspective on what is important to human beings and uh, there's nothing more important than food and agri. So we all are working in this space. So we all have to be very fortunate and happy and uh, you know, uh, grateful that uh, we are working in a wonderful area that's uh, relevant and important to the humanity. Uh, so that, with that thought, uh, thank you all uh, for the audience and the speakers. So it's a wonderful session. And I think the recording will also be available. Uh, thank you very much. OK? Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great yep. day. Yep. Thank you.